Hello everybody, this is uh, uh, Viking Aircraft Engines reporting from Florida. It's 2018. Traditionally we have done a lot of high wing Zenit aircraft and now this uh, year, 2018, we've done five of the low wing 601 XLs and 650 Zenit, Zenit aircraft with the Viking 130 horsepower engine. We're going to go through the procedure of installing one of the Viking 130s in this airplane. Um, this will be in various steps as in, we're first just going to do a very quick overview of what you have to do as far as the basics and for those that are not interested after that point to stop the video and have a sandwich. However, we are going to show how to mount the engine real quick, uh, how to mount the accessories that come in your firewall forward, and just generally give an overview of what you would do from receiving your Viking engine on a pallet with your firewall forward kit until you have a flying airplane. First, let's cover the big pieces. Of course, you're gonna get an engine on the pallet. You're going to get an engine mount. Uh, you will get your batteries and the electrical stuff that goes with that, like your battery contactors. You will receive some of the electrical parts, your buses, your starter relay, your starter switch. The throttle cable is dependent upon the airplane but it's always the same kind that you would obtain from aircraft spruce, just different lengths. Your coolant tank and your gearbox vent tank for the oil, all of the hoses and elbows for your cooling system, of course your radiator system, which cools the engine. You have to get some three inch scrap aluminum or some something from McMaster card just to make a box. You can make the box any which way you want. Just something to hold the air from leaking out from the radiator. Being a low wing airplane, uh, we decided on this installation, which turned out nice. Since we have a radiator here anyhow, we put our little sump tank behind the radiator on the belly. Then all the fuel is out of the cabin and we've got gravity feed from both wings right there. And if you ever had to work on it, guess what? You wouldn't get anything inside the plane, no smell or anything like that. It's all right there. So those are the components. And now we're gonna cover everything a little bit more in detail of how you would go by doing this. First, we're just quickly gonna go through what the objectives are. And we're gonna start with the first objective, which is to mechanically mount <clears throat> the physical parts to the airplane. Then we're going to wire these parts and then we're going to add the necessary fluids and then we're going to start the engine, you know, and then eventually install the propeller and the cowling. So let's start with the first objective, which is to mount all physical parts. Grab your engine mount and then have it powder coated if you'd like, or have it powder coated by Viking before you receive it. There's a small extra charge for that, but not very much. Install the bolts through the firewall or from the inside and on a lot of Zenits. Those bolts are not included only because again, every airplane is a little bit different. Tighten that all down and that completes the engine mount installation, very basic. Hoist the engine, hoist it with a lot of ratchet straps. That's what we like to do here in order so that you can adjust the engine by ratcheting one on the other. Always have a safety strap in the middle in case something goes wrong, that the engine can never fall. Install your rubber dampers. Some of them use the small red dampers on top and some larger ones on the bottom. Other models use the uh, rubber silicone cone-shaped dampers everywhere. So I install with the uh, bolt through the engine mount, large washer, rubber, Rubber on the other side, another large washer, small washer, and a nut. And then just do that in all four locations. Obviously do it gradually uh, so that the engine has a, 
way of settling into the mounts. That will include the engine mount installation. And the engine is now on your airplane. Of course, up until this point, you would have had to support the tail of the airplane because the airplane is not nose heavy in yet. At this point, the airplane will, for the first time, sit on its own, on its own wheels. Now, what I would do next is grab your cowlings and fit your cowlings. You'd have to put this turtle deck on with Clecos because the cowling lays on top of that. We just completed the fitment of the cowling on this aircraft and it's a very straightforward procedure. There are a lot more details of how to do that in other videos. You fit the cowling and then put that aside. After that, grab your radiator assembly and just physically mount it to the belly of the airplane. You're going to end up drilling a couple of holes in here, uh, a couple of inches in front of the spar, one there and one over there. And then also make a couple of brackets up front that mount the radiator on the front part, like that and like that. Just a couple of scrap pieces of aluminum. We tilted them a little bit to avoid the existing rivets on the on the bottom of the firewall. Get some three inch pieces of your uh, fuel injection hose and the threaded rods and then tap the radiator carefully so you don't crack anything with uh, quarter 20 and then red Loctite your studs in there and then uh, push the radiator up through and assemble everything. That basically gets the radiator hanging to the airplane. As far as the alignment, yeah, you need to make sure that these hoses will clear your firewall. And also, <clears throat> later on, we're going to talk now about the fuel system. And it just happens to be that the little header tank would fit right behind the radiator. And you can kind of see here how the header tank, if you kind of also kind of lay everything out backwards, this is the landing gear. And then you've got one row of rivets right next to the landing gear, in front of the landing gear. Then there's another rivet. And then there's about an inch or three quarters of an inch to an inch. And then you've got your, your header tank. So you can lay it out that way too because the header tank is right up against the, the radiator right here. So that takes care of your main components as far as the big stuff. Now, let's go back up inside the airplane because when you go through your box of stuff that came with the engine, there's quite a few other items. Now, we're not getting into electrical stuff, but like I said, there are things that need to be physically mounted, like your contactor. So just drill a couple of holes in your shelf here and put your contactor in with some AN3 bolts. Uh, make some little brackets for your batteries and use the foam blocks that come with the batteries and put those in the channel here. Of course, one of the brackets has to be removable so you can pull the batteries out. We've added a little hole in the firewall next to every electrical connector, main connector from the battery, since they're so close to the firewall, little plastic grommets. That way we can <clears throat> route wires directly through the firewall and just use a little silicone when we're done in each hole without having wires running all over the place. Then you're gonna mount your firewall pass-through, also comes with the system. And eventually that gets filled up with all different things. It's amazing at the end what goes through all that. And then mount your, uh, your bottles. They're just mounted through the top shelf of the uh, cross, cross brace over on the firewall here. Very easy. Uh, grab some of your electric components. Uh, mount the ECU right here on this uh, shelf in the middle. This has been designated now as the engine shelf, as in though everything that goes on here is related to the engine only. 
The avionics are going to go on the back of the panel and can make other shelves for that, but we're just trying to keep this for the engine. ECU, mount your ECU, put some uh, two-sided sticky foam tape on it, and put a couple of screws through the shelf. Use some larger snapping grommets at each end <clears throat> in order, because you know you're going to be running wires everywhere, so you might as well put, physically put access for that now. And then mount your uh, the four switches that are needed for your turning on battery one, battery two, fuel pump one, fuel pump two, and the two breakers for the fuel pump one and the fuel pump two. And a starter switch, which also be used for keeping the alternator alive on the uh, accessory section. And that's basically all you have to do as far as physically mounting things, other than of course eventually you will be adding a prop extension and a propeller to the front of the airplane. Tom Neal departing with his uh, 650 Zenit and a Viking 130. Let's talk a little bit more about the fuel system, <clears throat> since, that, since that could be an obstacle with uh, low-wing aircraft. Now, what we've done here is just uh, very simply, you see there's just a hose hanging here that is gonna come from the wing. You can put a low-pressure filter in it if you want, but uh, it enters the Zenith low-wing aircraft right down in this corner in front of the spar. And then from there, it's the simplest thing ever. You basically have your header tank, as we showed, mounted underneath. And then you're gonna have, uh, you basically hang the header tank with this stud. You glue two 1032 studs into the top of the header tank with red Loctite. And then you drill two holes, make a paper template uh, for the studs. One is in front of the spar here. Um, and the other one, uh, you can see two studs there. One is to hold the radiator. The other one holds the center of the header tank. And you can see how it's just, for lining all this stuff, it's about three quarters of an inch ahead of that flange on the front of the spar. And then there are two larger holes left and right of it. And 90 degree barbed elbows go in there. And then that's it. That's fuel from the left side of the airplane and the right side of the airplane draining right into the header tank, which has all of your fuel system components right there. Your fuel pumps, regulators, uh, return system, everything is in that tank. So it's a very clean installation there. The other hanging or attach bolt for the header tank is down inside this cover. Take the passenger seat cover and then it's over in this area. And in fact, we might be able to, might be able to see it down in here. Yeah, whatever, it's down in there. And that's how you support the tank. And then of course you need those two brass elbows. And other than that, just run your hose right to it. If you're gonna put low pressure filters there, uh, there are some filters built into the pump units, but having an additional filtration through some low pressure fuel filters, like these guys wouldn't hurt. Of course, if you can fit them in the wing route, not inside the airplane, uh, would be nice. Now, let's look at the uh, 
tank itself more in detail underneath here. Basically, uh, we took some pictures and now we're gonna look at what all this stuff is. So you've got the tank itself mounted as we showed up above and the input hoses in the, in the floor in there. So that fills the tank. Then the exit part, you know, there's a couple of uh, connectors there for electricity, turn the pumps on. We're gonna show that later. And then we have your snap-on connector, connectors um, at the output side right there. And then it goes to this uh, splitter or this little uh, check valve box. Basically, there are check valves in these pumps but in additional, since we cannot afford to have one fail and fuel feeding from one pump back into the other rather than going to the engine, we have this additional setup with brass check valves. Uh, so fuel enters here and it enters there from the pumps and then it cannot back feed to the other pump. And handily, uh, or also uh, part of that uh, aluminum machine block, it makes it easy to add your fuel pressure transducer, and then of course an exit to your high pressure filter, and then from there forward to the engine. And of course the nice thing is it's all here, outside the airplane, um, accessible for maintenance, not visible from anywhere outside the airplane. If somebody thought that this was an eyesore, uh, of course when you build your radiator box, you just extend the sides uh, all the way back to the landing gear and then you can't see any of it. So that's, uh, that's an option. Now, when the hose leaves here, uh, it is then tied to the center support that Zenit has on the belly of the airplane in several spots. And then it just is routed clear. You have to make sure it's clear of the steering mechanism and then it just, it's an unbreached fuel hose, fuel injection hose, the good quality stuff. And then it just kind of goes and follows some other hoses. And all the way from there to the engine with another quick disconnect here to the high pressure pump, mechanical pump, there's no breach. That's the mechanical installation of the tank and running the hoses. And then of course we have to do a little electrical work in a second. Hey Tom. Hey John. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are and uh, why you're flying airplanes around. Well, I'm an old pilot that just started when he was, got my license when I was 70. Been flying for seven years. Built this plane. It had a 110 Viking in it when I started and uh, had it for about four years and I decided to upgrade to the 130. It's considerably a different plane now. It flies Well, tell us about when you flew with the 110. It was also by Viking, right? It was by Viking as well. And okay. It's just fine, stable engine, uh, no vibration, no noise, uh, quite dependable. The 130 just seemed to have a little more horsepower and a little bit more modern engine parts, so I decided to upgrade to it. Okay. And, and now that's been done, so... Uh, maybe explain to people exactly what we did. Well, we, we replaced everything from here forward. Uh, cowling, engine, propeller, spinner, uh, radiator. It's, it's a total package and uh, had a test flight just a few minutes ago and everything just worked perfect. Okay, and then uh, you did uh, your flight and then uh, uh, people from Vikings have been flying it for a little bit, get, you know, get the hours up for that five-hour fly-off so that you can uh, can go home today. I'm looking forward to it. Yo, Viking put in all day yesterday test flying, and I get to fly today. Yeah, and your flight today, uh, what was your experience like? Oh, it's wonderful. Wonderful, cloudy, I mean, nice, nice clear day, no, no thermals. I can't wait to get up and fly home. This is going to be great. Okay, and as far as the exact difference between the 110 and the 130, like from today's experience being up there, what did you notice? Well, I noticed it uh, actually has a considerable more horsepower than I thought it would. It's got, it, it gets off the ground quicker, uh, responds better. Uh, if anything, at idle, it still keeps flying. <laughs> the 110, when I put it to idle, actually 
started losing quite a bit of altitude. This one, you've got to anticipate that it doesn't, right. it doesn't quite drift down as fast as a 110. All right. So, but that's just, have to do that. That's experience. All right, well, it's been wonderful to have you here. We had a good time working together on this project. And then uh, we'll hear from you when you get back home. I'll definitely give you a call when I get home. This wiring is a little bit of a challenge for some. First start by adding a ground wire from each battery to each end of your grounding bus. And then in addition to the number 10 grounds that go to the buses or to the bus, the ground bus, you have to run a number six to, uh, from the negative side, strain relieve it to the airframe, then bring it onto the engine, strain relieve it again, and then bolt it to the engine. And we'd like to do that on both batteries. And these are then to carry the starting current uh, when the engine's cranking. And so from the negative side, strain relief to the airframe, <clears throat> then bring it to the uh, engine, strain relief to the engine, and bolt to the engine. So there's a total of four ground wires, two large ones to the engine, and two smaller ones to the airframe or to the airplane grounding for all the stuff that goes inside the airplane. All right, so doing one wire at a time, going from your ground bus, go to the number 85 on the starter relay. Continuing with the grounds, add, make up two little jumpers from your ground bus to the two switches that are going to ground your contactors. Battery one, battery two. So the next two wires are your ground wires for the fuel pumps. Uh, grounds are the uh, ones closest to the uh, fuel outlet. So that's these guys. So you splice those on to a couple of leads, and then bring them up through the floor right there. And then for your left and your right fuel pump, or one and two or whatever you want to call them, and then they come up through the floor here, a little grommet. And obviously you're gonna follow your structure here through the nice grommets we put in here earlier and then to your ground. So those go directly to ground. Next, to uh, make up your diode assemblies. Crimp a, a large terminal to one side and a small one to the other side. And it goes between uh, one on each uh, contactor. Just stick those on there. Don't put the hardware on yet but the stripe on the diode goes towards the battery terminal, which is marked right there. B for battery, or battery it says, BET. All right, so stick those on there and just leave everything loose for right now. You might wanna solder these, you know, it's a hard metal to hard metal contact. If you don't feel like you're getting a good grip uh, crimp, we have a tool that does a good job on it, but if you are uncertain and just uh, use non-insulated terminals and solder. All right, so we got all our grounds done. Now let's do the, the heavy cabling for the, uh, for the um, power side. So what we've got is uh, two contactors and two batteries. We're gonna join the contactors together with one cable. And that's at the side of the contactor, the output side, which is the side that doesn't say BAT, B-A-T, battery. So opposite of the battery side, Make up a uh, number six cable and go to the other term, other um, contactor. So that's the first cable to be made and installed. Now we're gonna make up two more cables uh, from the positive side of each battery to the input side of each contactor, which is the one that does say battery. And it's also the one where the diode has the stripe facing towards and is attached to. We did that to one side and we do the same to the other side. The positive wire goes to each of the input sides of the battery contactor from the positives on the batteries. Since the solenoids are connected together now at the output side, uh, we use one of the contactors as a attach point at the output side for our starter wire that's going to power our starter. 
which means we are in, in effect able to start the engine from both batteries or one battery or the other battery because they are connected with the jumper wire we made earlier. So now we're going to put loom on this cable because it is going to be hot and or plus 12 volt, lots of current and also running up against engine components. So we're running, we're strain relieving on the airframe and we're strain relieving once we jump over to the engine with some tie wraps or ADAL clamps. And then we're getting up to the starter and we're making a nice crimp and installing our bolt loosely there because the next step is going to be the alternator cable. We're now going to supply the 12 volt output from the alternator to the positive side of the heavy cabling we just did for the battery so we can charge those batteries. One battery or both or the other depending on which contactor or both contactors are on at any one time. We're coming out of the alternator here. First thing we do is strain relieve. Uh, we're just using the leftover threads on this bolt for the alternator to do that with a clamp. And then, because this is a, um, an area we've repeatedly seen failures, right at this point, the terminal will fail. The alternator actually vibrates more than the engine. It kind of sits out there in space and it will vibrate more than the engine, so this is super critical, or you will have a failure right here and arcing going on. From there we go to our 60 amp fuse that came with your installation kit. And then from the output side of that, we're feeding the alternator current through a strain relief again on the engine up to the starter terminal and now we can put our 12 millimeter or 8 millimeter with 12 millimeter flats nut onto the starter and tighten that down. All right, next we actually have to power up our main, main power bus. By the way, these uh, two buses here are for the engine only. This entire center section has been dedicated to the engine. We got the ECU on the bottom, starter relay and uh, power buses. Uh, one ground, one power. Uh, would not like to see um, all kinds of other avionics or landing lights or anything else on these buses because guess what? This is to make the engine run. And you don't care about a landing light if the engine is quitting because some other part of the system fried the uh, electrical components that were designated and should be designated to run the engine only. We just uh, installed uh, power to one end here and power to the other end. So basically we powered it up with redundancy. Even though the contactors do close and we could have run just one wire at the output side of the contactor to the bus, we elected to run one also from the other contactor. So we have redundancy like we've been done in all the wiring so far. Okay, right here, the 10 gauge wire actually goes on the opposite side of this contactor. This was a mistake and it's been moved to the opposite side. So the output side of each contactor to feed your main power bus. Get on the, the low amperage side of the positive, we did all the grounds. Uh, we did mount the uh, starter relay. So from the bundle that comes with the ECU, there is a wire and it is marked starter. So it is going to go to the top of this relay the way it's sitting now. As you can see, there's a, a three vertical posts on this relay looking up from the back. There's one on the bottom now, one on each side. The relay is controlled then after we put the starter wire with uh, this wire right here that goes one to positive and one to the negative side here. Um, one of course has to be switched and it, you'll see that on the wire diagram and it is switched uh, with the ignition switch which we've already mounted here by going to the center post on it. So when you crank, when you put it on the crank mode, uh, you get power through that switch to your relay which closes and energizes the starter. Another 
low amperage wire then is the positive output from your bus to the battery terminal of the ignition switch, which is this one over here. Another wire from the bundle on the ECU is the um, yellow with black, and it, it is marked alternator. It just passes through and goes down to the alternator field, which is on the ignition switch as well. And you would, in, you would add that to the ignition output of the ignition switch, which means when you let go of the key after cranking, the alternator now gets power and will put out amperage. You would then turn the ignition key to the off position in order to remove the, uh, so there's off. Now you're on alternator, and then of course there's cranking is the next mode. So after you're done cranking, starting the engine, you go here, the alternator is now charging. You would be reading voltage, charging voltage, and you could turn both of your masters off and the engine would then be in an emergency mode where it would run on the alternator. You don't want to make that a habit, but it should, and it should be tested once in a while, that you turn this off, turn this off, it will still run, and then you shut, then you shut your uh, alternator off and the engine will quit. So that's the wiring. Now we're getting into the fuel pumps. Again, you're picking up two wires from your positive bus down to your fuel pump breakers. One for one breaker, one for the other breaker. After you install those two wires, you take two more wires from the other side of the breaker and you jump over to your fuel pump switch. After you've completed those two wires, you go from the other two terminals on fuel pump one and fuel pump two switch and you wire them down to through the hole in the floor and you get down to your fuel pump system which we looked at before except this time you're wiring up the positive wires rather than the negative wires which we just did a second ago and we've now bundled that up tie wrapped everything and the wires are following the hoses and they go right up through the floor into the cabin.